Good afternoon and welcome to our daily COVID-19 update for the town of Plymouth. This is number 69. I'm Steve Trifletti, your Plymouth Town Moderator. We're here each Wednesday at noon for this update. And this forum is being brought to you live by PAC TV on Comcast channels 13 and 15 and Verizon channels 43 and 47. You can also watch this on PAC TV's streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email us to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. These forums can also be replayed at PACTV.org slash Plymouth. Today's participants include uh, Kenneth Tavares. He is the chair of the Plymouth Select Board. We're also joined by Dr. Philip Trufletti and, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Mark Wilson. He's the active professor emeritus, University of Michigan School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology. Also, Sarah Cloud. She is the Director of Behavioral Health at Beth Israel Deaconess in Plymouth. Justin Domingos is the Director of Athletics at Plymouth North High School. Michael Jackman is District Director for Massachusetts Congressman William Keating. Heather Cosby is a Plymouth CPA. Amy Naples is the Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. And each Wednesday, we're also joined by our Plymouth uh, State Representative Matthew Muratori. We're gonna begin as we do each week uh, with the chair of the Plymouth Select Board, Ken Tavares. Ken, uh, you've been very busy. I saw last night uh, that the Select Board had a meeting and it involved a uh, discussion about Plymouth's response uh, to the pandemic. Good day. And you're on. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't hear Steve at all. Yeah, we none of us. Okay. okay, Ken. Good morning, everyone. Go ahead. I hope uh, we're having, it sounds like we're having problems with the audio. Ken, you're, mu you're muted now, Ken. There you go. Go ahead, Ken. Starting over again, uh, we have... Uh, Good news from the town clerk's office. There are 18,194 requests into the town clerk for ballots. As of this morning, 17,314 have been mailed out. Uh, Pearl Sears would also like us to know that uh, as soon as the rest of the ballots are out, they'll start uh, inputting into the computer the ones that are received. So if you're looking to track your ballot, not going to show up yet, but that'll take uh, probably two to three days. Also, everyone should be uh, made aware that early voting starts this weekend on Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 2 at Town Hall. And then during the week, uh, the early voting will be open uh, at the same hours as, as Town Hall. So there are some great opportunities to take advantage of uh, early voting in the next two weeks. Also, uh, I'd like to just take a minute to speak to you really as neighbor to neighbor. And that is that we want you to be sure that you are aware that the town of Plymouth, as of last week, has moved into the higher risk red category of COVID cases. This means there are greater than eight active cases per 100,000 residents. In the event that our positive cases continue to go up, we will be forced take a step back to phase three, step one. And these numbers are updated daily on the public health website at www. Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the Plymouth Select Board. Uh, we're now going to begin with our health segment and today we're going to begin with Dr. Mark Wilson. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, Steve, and thank you. Hello to everyone. Um, as I've done in previous sessions, um, I'd like to start with a few questions that um, should be of interest to a broader audience. Uh, First one is, what is the current situation with COVID vaccine 
development? And are we any closer to having one that I can get sometime soon? So I thought a little history here might be, be interesting and useful. Currently, there are more than 200 COVID vaccines under development throughout the world. And some of these, many of these, in fact, are in very early stages, but you are quite now uh, advanced. Um, remember that there are three phases of clinical trials that must be uh, undertaken in order to uh, develop a vaccine for eventually being approved. Um, of these 200, roughly 170 are in a preclinical development phase, which means they're, they're just being tested in animals and, and uh, laboratory experiments. There are 10 vaccines undergoing phase one clinical trials, so they're being tested in a small number of Um, some of whom are in high risk of illness. And then finally, there are at least yeah, 10 vaccines in the world now being tested in the most advanced phase yeah. three clinical trials. Approval by the FDA can only happen after um, enough scientific evidence has been accumulated for these independent scientists to determine that the vaccine provides a benefit and that benefit outweighs any known or potential risk. Right now, the global effort to create a COVID-19 vaccine, which began in January, um, it, it, it's involving very new techniques that are um, modern in many Vaccine will take years of efforts of effort before it can be uh, approved and distributed widely. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and yet, despite this urgency, no steps in the trial phases will be skipped by the United States companies that um, that are developing vaccines. And this is true of most other countries as well. U.S. FDA has has recently uh, reaffirmed that uh, no vaccine will be approved until proven safe and effective in preventing or decreasing disease symptoms. And this has to be true for at least 50% of the people who receive it. Um, by comparison, the CDC estimates that an annual flu vaccine uh, really only protects effectively in the range of 40 to 60, 60. After the pandemic began, the, the U.S. Uh, set a really ambitious, extremely ambitious goal of developing a coronavirus vaccine in 12 to 18 months. By comparison, um, virtually all other major infectious disease vaccines have taken much longer to develop. I thought this interesting uh, set of numbers would, would uh, provide some comparison. So for the polio vaccine, it took seven years to develop that vaccine. This was back in 1948 through 1955. Measles took nine years from 1954 to 1963. Chickenpox, which uh, the, the research on that began in 1954, required 34 years before we had an effective vaccine, and the mumps, mumps vaccine was the quickest taken only four years. So, um, and and for HIV. The coronavirus vaccines are, are being much more quickly developed, in part due to the enormous government funding of research. Um, and uh, this speed is also due to these new technologies that I mentioned. So I don't have enough time to go into the details, but uh, basically these are for using genetic material that is uh, injected as part of the vaccine, which allows our body to essentially develop our own uh, vaccine factories, if you will, in cells, and then this stimulates the immune response that will that will be effective in preventing uh, replication of the virus if you were actually infected. So it's a, it's a modern technology that's been proven and is being used in many other vaccines, um, and it will allow us to uh, move things much, much more quickly. We have to remember, though, that each approved vaccine 
um, will require government uh, approval, uh, but then eventually we'll have to produce a large enough amount and distribute it in large quantities. There'll have to be a consideration of the moral and ethical issues of who should be prioritized for receiving the vaccine. And we also have to deal with the mistrust that some people have of vaccines in general and maybe of this COVID vaccine uh, in particular. So we're really, in a sense, um, despite the speed, this incredible speed of vaccine progress, uh, it's really unprecedented. We're still perhaps a year or two away from widespread vaccination that will effectively reduce new cases to, to really low levels. So in the meantime, um, as Ken just mentioned, we have a very effective proven public health mitigation, mitigation method, uh, which is wearing a mask, distancing, uh, washing your hands and so forth. Please, we need to practice this. This is going to protect your fellow citizens as well as yourself. Uh, the next question is, I recently heard that CDC now considers transmission of the coronavirus by small airborne particles or fine droplets to be more possible than was previously thought. Has something changed? So first, consider, consider the research that has shown that the COVID virus is most efficiently transmitted through infectious droplets. That we all know, um, droplets that are expelled from the mouth and nose. These droplets contain the virus that can then infect the respiratory system of someone else nearby. Um, and this usually happens within a few seconds or at most a minute, let's say. Um, and this is why using a mask and keeping a distance is so effective in reducing transmission. In addition, it's possible but less likely that you can be infected through touching a, a, a surface that has the virus lying on it, um, which is also why hand washing uh, is recommended. But the notion that very fine droplets, must, much like um, dust particles or, or pollen, can become airborne and float in the air for hours or perhaps even days um, and thereby transport and transmit the virus um, hasn't really been carefully investigated. It's now clear that this can be a source of transmission of the coronavirus, but um, it, it's probably not an important one. This kind of, it's called aerosol or airborne transmission, um, is responsible for uh, diseases like measles and chickenpox, those viruses, for example. Um, and they represent diseases that are efficiently spread by airborne, which means they often have high attack rates uh, because they can quickly reach and infect many other people in a short period of time. If the COVID virus was predominantly transmitted by aerosol or airborne, um, we would have had a much more rapid global spread in the early age, early stages of the uh, pandemic. And so epidemiologic studies really indicate that COVID virus has spread uh, like most other common respiratory viruses and that droplet transmission is the primary, within a, within a very short distance, is the primary mode of transmission. So the CDC actually recently revised its description of transmission stating that this airborne route is possible under special circumstances. However, let me emphasize again, it's probably not one of the most important ones. Um, there are several well-documented examples where this, this kind of transmission appears to have occurred over long distances or after a long period of time, um, but it does appear uncommon. And so the CDC notes that um, existing prevention guidelines are sufficient to address transmission both through close contact and under these special circumstances. So at present, there's no need for any special engineering controls or new public health guidelines. Again, what we should all be doing, wearing a mask and keeping distance, is highly effective in reducing or in actually preventing transmission. So it behooves all of us to respect our fellow citizens and do so. Let me stop right there and I'd be happy to answer any questions later on in the session. Thank you, that's Dr. Mark Wilson. He is an epidemiologist who resides in Plymouth. Uh, we're now gonna go to Sarah Cloud. She's the Director of Behavioral Health at Beth Israel Deaconess. And Sarah, there's been a lot going on in our community, including last night, the Plymouth School Committee had a special meeting in order to review the response to the coronavirus. Uh, what do you have for us today? 
Great. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm so glad that they're having these special meetings and keeping the lines of communication and transparency open. Um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to find new ways to test our patients, our civility, our sanity, and even our sense of community by putting additional strains on our systems. You know, and this is particularly evident as our caregivers and school personnel continue to navigate the COVID-2021 school year. So as youth and school personnel exhibit signs of respiratory illness, which may be something as simple as an allergy or a common cold or, or symptoms of, of COVID, they are sent home and, asked to re or, and or asked to remain remote. And test results can often take days to be received. And once received, people still have the right for privacy under HIPAA. So HIPAA is short for uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, which is a federal law that requires the creation of national standards protect, to protect sensitive patient health information from being disclosed without the person's consent or knowledge. So navigating HIPAA during the pandemic is a, just another challenge. Um, but those who have been in close contact to a person who's tested positive, which constitute a possible exposure, is alerted as part of contact tracing. So that's kind of that fine, uh, the, 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 that fine line of balance that, that we strike. And so, but the speculation and the waiting and the not knowing puts the community on edge and understandably so. But the speculation and anxiety leads to rumors and innuendos that actually can spread faster than the virus itself on social media. So our minds are always programmed to go to the worst case scenario. So the virus is not only making people sick physically, but it's also invading kind of the fabric of our society by pitting members of our community against each other. The good news is there's a lot that we can do to combat the, the virus and this effect that it's having on us. Um, so I'm gonna always encourage you to fall back um, to the reset position by taking a close look and asking yourself at, uh, by asking yourself, what is in my control and what is not? What is, it, what is not in, within my control is whether someone will test positive or whether they'll share that information with me and how soon I'll have that information. What is within my control is taking precautions if you or your child was exposed. Um, it's in our control to uh, try to take really good care of ourselves. It is our, within our control to wear masks. It's within our control to physically distance. And if we are concerned that we've been exposed or we're concerned um, about symptoms, it's within our control to ensure that, you know, we're, we're reaching out, we're getting tested and we're quarantined and staying away from others during that process. Um, so I want, just wanted to kind of you know, continue to remind folks as, as difficult as this well, is this is day, day, that um, we continue to look at what's within our control and exercise that. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Cloud is the Director of Behavioral Health at Beth Israel Deaconess in Plymouth. She'll be here to answer your questions. You can send them to us at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And today we welcome for the first time Justin Domingos. He is the Director of Athletics for Plymouth North High School. Uh, Justin, welcome. And I know that on Monday, the holiday, there were several uh, golf matches that were uh, canceled or postponed, but I don't think it was because of the coronavirus. I think it was because of the holiday. But uh, what can you tell us about uh, athletics in uh, Plymouth's response to the coronavirus? Sure, Steve. Thanks for having me. Um, we did have some games and matches canceled yesterday because of the rain. Um, but uh, not for coronavirus. Um, right now with athletics, you know, kind of piggybacking on Dr. Wilson and, and what Sarah were talking about, you know, we are cautiously optimistic uh, four weeks into our athletic season, both at Plymouth North High School and Plymouth South. Um, you know, we're, we're playing boys and girls soccer, volleyball, field hockey, and we're running boys and girls cross country. Uh, all of our athletes and coaches are practicing good hygiene, you know, we're, we're constantly sanitizing our hands. All of our athletes wear masks when appropriate, whether it's during competition, when they're coming to the fields, leaving the fields. Um, and we're making sure that we're sanitizing all of our touch surfaces. So, you know, that means as an athletic director during soccer games, I'm sanitizing balls in between quarters. Uh, our field hockey players don't touch the balls only with their sticks. Uh, so there's a real onus on, on making sure that we're doing the little things correctly and I think, you know, again, cautiously optimistic four weeks in here, but we're, we're off to a, a good start. And it's great to see 
uh, the young men and young women in Plymouth on the fields competing again. Thank you. Uh, Justin Domingos, he is the Director of Athletics for Plymouth North High School, and he's here to answer your questions during our question and answer. At this time, we're going to go to Michael Jackman. He is the District Director uh, for our Congressman Bill Keating. Uh, Michael, uh, you work with the Congressman. He is an elected federal official, and at the federal level, we're hearing lots of information. At times, it is inconsistent. Uh, what does your office recommend that we follow? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, thank you, Steve, as always, and thank you to PAC TV for having me on. In terms of um, recommendations with uh, the best way to prevent the spread of COVID, I think Ken and Dr. Wilson and everyone else on the call has talked about the importance of hand washing, the importance of wearing a mask, the importance of physically distancing, limiting um, the size of groups, especially for indoor gatherings. I think all the recommendations that the town is following flow from the CDC and flow from the Mass DPH and from the best science that's available. So we certainly um, recommend that. Our offices have been closed to the public since the pandemic started. We are working full-time, uh, mostly from home. Occasionally, I, I go in to make sure the mail hasn't piled up too high. Um, but uh, we do follow those recommendations. We're really pleased to see how many uh, businesses, organizations, the schools, the town government, um, healthcare providers, how, how rigorously people are, are adhering to those recommendations. So we're pleased and gratified by that, and we're happy to provide any information that we can to people. Um, in terms of information, uh, people are wondering if there's any information about another stimulus plan. And unfortunately, um, there has not been a plan approved by both branches uh, of Congress, the House and the Senate. House has approved several plans. The Senate has made counterproposals of smaller plans with a piece by piece um, uh, aspects of, of relief that um, the House has not agreed to, unfortunately. So there has not been a plan for a second stimulus check or another round of uh, payroll protection programs or funding, which the House included for cities and towns and states, because we're seeing the huge shortfalls that towns like Plymouth and, and Commonwealth of Massachusetts are seeing in their uh, tax revenue um, collections. And uh, that's affecting the budgets. It's affecting the budget this year, but it's gonna have a long-term effect too. So we recognize that and we're hopeful that there will be some relief that includes funding so that cities, towns, and the states, the states can all keep their uh, payrolls intact as well. So uh, unfortunately, no news on that. And, and that also means no extension for unemployment which as we know, the CARES Act unemployment stipend, uh, the $600 extra stimulus was uh, ended at the end of July and the president extended that by shifting some funds around for a $300 uh, stipend for, I think it was five, maybe six weeks in, in August and September, but that has ended too. So uh, we are still seeing a lot of unemployment uh, cases, folks calling us, the unemployment systems, not only in Massachusetts, but across the whole country, uh, were uh, beset by a fraud ring that was making false claims and trying to get unemployment that belonged to other people. And they're still working through that. And unfortunately, we have a lot of folks calling our offices who are still trying to confirm their identity and confirm that they are um, validly filing the, those unemployment claims. The other issue that's that's cropping up, especially with the end of the Commonwealth's eviction moratorium, which is scheduled to end this Saturday, I believe, October 17th, is housing. Uh, folks who have been out of work since March or have been severely reduced wages, uh, medical hardships maybe, have, have really had been struggling to pay their rent or, re, or their mortgage. Um, the governor did announce a plan to um, dedicate some funding to 
different programs, the RAFT program, which is rental assistance for families in transition. There's gonna be an extra $100 million injected into that program. 48.7 million injected into the home-based rapid rehousing program. Um, then additional funding for legal assistance for tenants and landlords to try to mediate um, eviction disputes. The, the reality is, and this might just might be conventional wisdom, but the, not only do these people need somewhere to go and, and live and be safe so they're not out on the streets and putting themselves at risk for contracting COVID, but uh, the reality is also that these landlords may not have too many other um, bidders for open apartments if they do evict their current, ten evict their current tenants. I saw in the news last night that um, rental uh, rates, uh, rents are down in pretty much all across the Massachusetts. So it's an economic factor and hopefully these funds will uh, address the, those economic, fa economic factors and also will um, keep people, as I said, off the streets and out of um, danger from contracting uh, the, the coronavirus. Um, the RAFT program and home base uh, locally are both available through NeighborWorks Housing Solutions, which is located right in Kingston. Uh, I think folks might remember it as South Shore Housing and after that, it became Housing Solutions and uh, was recently merged with NeighborWorks. So it's now known as NeighborWorks Housing Solutions. And you can uh, reach out and be in touch with them by calling 781-422-4200. Um, and the other thing I just wanna mention about housing is uh, if people don't know about it, Habitat for Humanity has a uh, COVID relief fund that they're making available to renters who are struggling to make their rent. It's uh, for low-income residents who have suffered a job loss, wage reduction, or medical hardship due to COVID and having trouble paying their rent. It's a one-time grant um, up to $1,000, which um, people can apply for through the House Habitat for Humanity website, which is hfhplymouth.org. And the only, the last thing I want to mention, I, kind of a, a not good news, but important that people recognize that the census is ending its enumeration efforts as of tomorrow, October 15th. The Supreme Court did side with the administration in uh, ordering the Census Bureau to end its enumeration efforts. So after tomorrow, you will not be able to respond to the census there won't be anyone knocking on your door, leaving pamphlets. If you go online, you have to file it by tomorrow night at midnight. So Thursday night. And the website there, so folks have it, is 2020, so 2020census.gov. Uh, you can also call. The number for English is 844-330-2020. For Spanish, it's 844-468. 2020. So that's all I have to report. And I look forward to any questions or comments. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michael Jackman. He is the district director for Congressman William Keating. Next, we welcome back Heather Cosby. Uh, Heather, you're a Plymouth uh, CPA. I know that you like to follow Mike so that you can react to any news he has at the federal level, but he has no new legislation. So what kind of advice can you give to our viewers as we're waiting for further uh, changes. Uh, thank you, Steve. It's nice to be back. I was actually waiting a few weeks for, to see if more information came out. Uh, there is some new information that I do want to go over. Uh, first thing is today is October 14th. Tomorrow is the last day of the filing season for 2019 tax returns. Uh, so the IRS has issued some informal comments that said if your return is not filed on time, to write COVID or add a note if it's electronically filed on your tax return because they do understand that they, there's no more extensions on deadlines, but uh, they're going to be pretty accommodating with any late filed returns. So, um, so we're, you know, like every other office trying to wrap things up on probably the most uh, difficult tax season that most practitioners have experienced. Um, so that was one item. The second item is all the PPP uh, loan forgiveness. So what has happened is there has been, number one, sba.gov has issued a frequently um, 
FAQ about just loan forgiveness. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew about that. You can see it at, at um, SBA.gov, and it has a lot of questions being answered. The second uh, new item is that SBA issued a um, streamlined application for loans under $50,000. So if your loan was under $50,000, there is a one-page uh, debt forgiveness application form. So uh, if you're a small business, a very small business that had a loan that small, you're going to want to start to look at that information. The, the next area is just actually to kind of have a general discussion about the environment of the PPP loan. And I'm going to give you my strategy and, and the strategy being used by a lot of other practitioners regarding some of these issues. First of all, under the current law, the IRS's position is that if you used your money, whatever you used your money for, those expenses are not deductible um, if you get your loan forgiven. So the issue is uh, there's a lot of dissent among even, you know, the legislators, they're like, that's not what we intended to do. Um, there's not going to be any laws coming out immediately until after the election. And so the problem is, when do you have to submit your debt forgiveness application? Uh, the SBA also clarified that it does not have to be submitted by October 31st. There was a lot of, of confusion about that among uh, loan applicants. So number one, you do not have to submit an application this month. You do not have to submit it until the end of the year is my understanding. There's going to be obviously more information coming about that. So as a practitioner, we have to look at the current law and we have to, come, we have to use a crystal ball a little bit to see what might be coming and then advise our clients. So this is the advice that I'm going to give my clients and that I'd like all businesses to consider and talk to their professionals about. Number one, if you don't get your loan forgiven during 2019, your expenses are deductible. Therefore, do not get your loan forgiven this year. Leave it alone. Submit your forms when SBA requires you to. You're going to need to do that through your bank. That gives you more time for Congress to figure out how to correct this issue of these expenses being deductible or not. It pushes off the burden of that issue another year. That is a, a deferral strategy, which is what we are paid to do. So definitely make sure you don't get your application approved during 2019. Secondly, you're going to want to continue to follow the uh, Senate Bill 30, 3612 which talks about this expense deduction. You're gonna to wanna to stay tuned for any changes that come out with the, with the law that's coming up. Um, there's money that was left on the table on the pre previous PPP round. They've gotta figure out if they're gonna disperse that money, if they're gonna allow businesses to have a second chance at that money and, and how would they do that. So, so just keep, keep checking sba.gov for this forgiveness information. A lot of banks are putting out webinars on uh, for their loan applicants, so go to your bank for their resources and uh, stay educated, but hold the trigger and don't do anything for a good another month. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Uh, and that's Heather Crosby, and she is a Plymouth uh, CPA. Uh, Heather is here to answer questions at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And next, uh, we're going to be going to Amy Naples. She is the executive director for the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Now, Amy, uh, recently I've uh, gone to Mass Ioneer a couple of times. They give us uh, hand sanitizer when we walk in, and they take my mask and they give me a new mask. And I heard last night when you were talking to the select board that the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce has been distributing masks to businesses, and businesses in turn have been giving them and making them available to the public. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about this? And specifically, is this for people without masks or people that have masks? Uh, how does the program work? Sure. So that is great to hear because um, particularly we know that masks are helping us get through this pandemic. And um, we had advocated for the mask mandate in the downtown and waterfront areas, particularly because those dining area, those are dining areas. Um, so people were walking through without masks on. So we, we felt it was very important for us to ensure the health of our local economy and keep those businesses going and operating. However, we were worried about the financial burden of people going in and looking for masks from the businesses. So we did purchase 4,000 masks and they have been distributed to all of the businesses in the downtown and waterfront that are in the um, mask mandated area. Um, on the signs, it says masks mandatory. And then 
um, don't have a mask, just ask. So we want to encourage folks that don't have them to go into a business and be able to have one. So it is a great opportunity. Um, it, it's just ensuring our community is on the same page and of course the financial burden. But um, I have to say, isn't today such a beautiful day to support our small businesses? So suggest to our viewers some outdoor dining or even some great retail shopping, um, but certainly supporting our small businesses. Um, thank you as always for having me on the panel. Um, today, I kind of wanted to cover some efforts regarding our Plymouth Recovery Task Force, which is an initiative from the Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce, which is important to collectively work with our partners in town, the Town of Plymouth, of course, Board of Health, C Plymouth, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation and the Plymouth Bay Cultural District, as well as leaders in various industry sectors. Since that collaboration is honestly so critical for our economic recovery in town here. So we have been working for many months and um, I wanted to share with you some plans we have and some items that we've worked on. Um, certainly the, the mass dis distributing to all the businesses was an important part of that. And of course, um, the signage around town enforcing the fact that the sanitation, the social distancing and the mask wearing is such an important part of um, our messaging. But um, I do wanna also communicate that as a community, we, all, we need everyone to support these initiatives and efforts. And we just really need to all work together to get out of the red so we can recover from the pandemic. And as you know, Plymouth is a red community, but at the same time, it's classified as a low risk. So we are, the state is currently in phase three, step two of the reopening plan, but Plymouth does not have to move out of that state unless we are in the red for three weeks. So we are going to work our tails off that we are not in the red for three weeks. And that is going to be, be a huge task, um, but we can all do that and get back into a low risk community. But, um, so basically what doesn't change for um, businesses, which there's been a lot of questions regarding is tables can still have 10 people at them. Um, bar seating is allowed with, of course, those guidelines in place that the governor has in regards to bar seating and dressing rooms will remain open. Again, if we are in the red for three weeks, we would have to go back and those, those um, new steps would not be part of that. Um, and then the efforts we have been working on um, a member of ours, Melissa Kenny of the task force met with Plymouth Schools Visual Performing Arts Department, Mike Capel and his faculty and has discussed many times about what we can do as a task force to help with the high school students. There had been a lot of concerns regarding the skate park and other fields and playgrounds around town. So kind of sparked this collaboration and the students actually the BPA have created posters that we're gonna be distributing throughout town where high school students gather at. So locations as a skate park, forges fields, school fields, local businesses, particularly around high school students, hangout spots, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, Manimate Youth Center. Um, so we are excited to get those out. Final drafts will be ready very soon. Um, it is challenging because the students are only in that class for once a week. So um, they've done an incredible job and super excited to share those with the community. We're also hopeful to be working with the police department on some initiatives and some ideas we have as a task force. Um, our task force meets each week and Chief Gautieri will be joining us tomorrow for the discussion. So we're excited to present those ideas to him. We did create a I wear my mask because um, campaign and which features leaders of the recovery task force. And it includes a picture and a quote. We're doing more outreach to our local legislators and leaders in our community on expanding those PSA campaigns. Those are also included in the Old Colony Memorial, which is a great opportunity for us to continue our awareness. We are working on a wear a mask campaign, WAM, for the 20 and 30s demographics with neon colors. We're gonna feature the key relatable people that they look up to maybe bartenders, local musicians, um, and kind of drive home the message that they can't go out to dinner, they can't have a mask, they can't gather with friends responsibly or hear their favorite bands unless they do these things. Um, and those will be distributed at local bars, restaurants, hair salons, barbers, um, those type of places. And of course, Instagram, as that's a huge um, 
platform for that demographic. Um, concentrating on the same age demographic, the 20 and 30 year olds, we are working with our higher education partners at Quincy, Cowery, Cape Cod, and Massasoit on some email messaging to their students. And then um, lastly, we are going to be hopefully some artwork around town at storefronts um, with great um, messaging, of course, unique artwork, um, utilize our scallop shell artists and just kind of have fun, unique, creative ways to get the message out. And um, it's important for us to be doing all of these because there's just so much that has to be done and we need to spread the word. So we'll continue those efforts as, long, as well as PSAs, working with local radio stations, of course, our local newspaper and all of that. So it is important for us to continue targeting those campaigns to the different demographics. Um, also, I did want to report last week, I missed you all because I was um, busy with the SBA. The first week of November is National Veterans Business Week, and we are partnering with the SBA on a virtual event on November 5th, 930 to 1130. We will feature three panelists who are veteran-owned businesses and also um, Plymouth Area Chamber members. These veterans will share their success stories, hurdles, offer advice um, for fellow veterans, um, so be on the lookout for those Zoom details. Um, we are super honored to be working with the SBA as they chose us to work on this event with. So it's a great opportunity for us to highlight our members and our, our veteran initiatives. And lastly, the Chamber has partnered with Mayflower Brewing on a pop-up. Yes, that's right, pop, P-U-P, -P, up this Sunday at Mayflower Brewing 11 to 4. Originally scheduled for Saturday, but we do see uh, quite a bit of rain in the forecast. So. It will be on Sunday. This is a very small market um, for dog related vendors, very similar to a farmer's market. We'll have a little photo op for you and your pooch, food truck, live entertainment. Both people and dogs will be able to wet their whistle. Thank you to Heather Cosby CPA for sponsoring our doggy drink station um, to remain, to make sure all of our dogs stay hydrated. Um, of the excitement of the day. So this is a small extension of the Mayflower um, Beer Garden and just a special day for our pooches. This event requires masks, social distancing, and we will be doing contact tracing, of course. And that is my update for today. Thank you, Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. She'll stay with us to answer your questions. Send them to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And now we Welcome back, State Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Matt, earlier this year, you sponsored legislation uh, for Plymouth Town Meeting to meet remotely. And this Saturday, we are going to meet once again with a virtual town meeting beginning at 8 a.m. Uh, you and I will be participating uh, in the opening ceremonies. Thank you for that. And we're hearing a lot about the red zone in Plymouth. So what do you have for us today? Yeah, thanks very much. And, and I, I really appreciate, you know, following Amy too, because she's so upbeat in the chamber of doing things to try to really make, you know, this new normal normal for us. So I really appreciate what uh, what Amy and the chamber is doing. Uh, let me try and clarify what, what, the, what this whole red zone is about. So Plymouth um, over the last three weeks went from, uh, from green, yellow to red. Uh, so red we hit last, uh, last Wednesday evening. Um, we were not surprised about that. I know some communities were surprised. Uh, we were not because we've been tracking these numbers uh, for, for daily for weeks uh, in this town. Uh, and and the, the, uh, the regulations on this are very clear. It's eight cases per day per 100,000 folks. So we are about 60,000 folks. So it's about four and a half cases a day is the max we can do. Um, I can tell you um, as of yesterday, um, and I hate to burst your bubble on this, Amy, but we're at 11.2. Um, you know, it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to get out of this, this red situation. And, and how it works, Steve, is that, um, is that uh, the, the, as the community is uh, in the red uh, for this past week, we're still considered a low risk. However, uh, and we are still in uh, phase two, uh, phase three, step two. And phase three, step two, was started October 5th, including, as, as Amy mentioned, tables, uh, restaurants can hold up to uh, 10 people. Uh, bar seating is allowed for eating and dressing rooms can remain, can be opened up. Uh, we're in danger of losing all that. I'm, I'm being very realistic with you on this. Um, 
if we are red for two more weeks, um, then we actually go uh, permanently uh, back down, I'm sorry, not permanently, but for quite some time, we'll go back to uh, phase three, step two. Uh, and then you need, after that, then you need it three weeks in a row of not being in the red in order to get out of it, in order to go back to tables for 10 people, uh, bar eating and dressing rooms, et cetera. So um, we've got a lot of work to do. As I said, we are at 11.2 positive cases in the last 13 days here in Plymouth. Uh, I believe it was yesterday alone, we had 13 cases. Um, so we're, we're really going in the wrong direction. I applaud the, uh, the chairman of the board uh, and the board members. I, I applaud the chamber. I applaud the uh, Justin and the school folks for what they're doing. There's gonna be a lot of education coming out um, uh, to, uh, to let people know uh, what's happening. Uh, the town, as you know, Steve, did a robocall just the other day uh, to really begin the education. Uh, that will continue. Um, posting that we've talked about posting the numbers, being sure people know what the numbers are on a daily basis, whether you're in the schools or whether you're in the town, to actually know what those numbers really are, uh, because there are now meetings to them, to these numbers. And the meetings to the numbers means that if we continue with the high numbers, we are going backwards in the economy here in Plymouth. And that's something that we really don't want to do. Nobody wants to do that. So we need to continue education. I know the, uh, uh, the delegation has been working uh, with the county and the state with regard to testing programs here in, the, in, the, in Plymouth. Uh, so we may be hearing about testing programs coming to Plymouth in the next week or so. Uh, and so much more is, is actually happening. Um, to look at the, uh, the state numbers, right now there are 137,565 cases uh, since March of confirmed coronavirus. Uh, the weighted seven day weighted average is at 1.2%. Uh, a month ago it was 0.8%, uh, uh, well below uh, the target of 5%. So we are seeing a bit of a surge, uh, but nowhere near where we were before. Uh, back at the height of this, which was April 23rd, uh, we had 3,944 people in the Commonwealth in the hospital. Uh, today, as of yesterday, I'm sorry, as 509 people in the hospital, 87 in the ICU and 27 uh, vents. Um, to date, uh, we have uh, over 2 point, almost 2.5 million people, individuals have been tested. And we've actually tested 4.8 million tests. So we are, we are doing very well with testing and tracing. Um, the BID hospital right now is at 25 ca uh, cases of COVID, either confirmed or suspected cases with no one in the ICU. Uh, Long-term care providers um, are at 25,214 cases since March, uh, with unfortunately 64% of all the deaths in the Commonwealth, 6,209 deaths have come from long-term care facilities. In Plymouth County, Plymouth County has hit the 10,000 mark. They're at 10,380 cases of coronavirus with 784 deaths. Uh, with regard to the, the Plymouth numbers, we are, have uh, since... Um, uh, September 29th, we were at 688 cases. We've, we've jumped up to 122 cases um, since then. Uh, we're, as, as of yesterday, 810 cases here right in Plymouth. 103 are active cases, uh, and the, the deaths remain at 76. Um, in, in, interestingly enough, Steve, um, close to 70% of these folks are under the age of 50. Uh, and that's what we're seeing the trend. You know, several months ago when we were talking, I was giving you numbers every day of, of folks over the age of 70 and 80 and, and 90 years old uh, that were dying from this and uh, getting and contracting it. It's just the opposite now. It's under the age of 50 that's actually uh, right here in Plymouth that's, uh, that is actually uh, contracting the disease. Um, as a, uh, I also wanna just give the school update as well. Uh, Justin and, and the school department, uh, they're doing a fantastic job. Kids are doing a fantastic job. I think we could take lessons from, from the kids and what they're doing. When going to school and doing the sports, the athletics and other activities they're doing, we, we could take, we could take a, a lesson from them. You know, just, just hear these numbers, Steve. There's 7,171 um, students and there are 1,369 employees in the school department here in Plymouth. And right now, um, as, as this is as of last Friday, by the way, there were two st students with COVID-19. Uh, there were three employees that were quarantined. 
um, because of uh, possible exposure. And there were 48 students um, uh, that were uh, not exposed, but because of close contact, they were quarantined. Um, it, it's just amazing. And, and, and out of those 7,171 students, um, good majority are in schools because there's only 676 in remote learning. So it kind of gives you an idea of how well uh, the Plymouth Public Schools are actually doing with this. Um, so we, we, well, we applaud them for what they're doing. And again, on, on the state level, um, you know, we continue to do testing and tracing. We're number one in the country for testing and tracing. Um, we, um, we have invested millions and millions of additional dollars into long-term care. Um, hospitals are now better prepared than they were uh, back in March. Uh, the capacity is there. If, if, a, if a surge comes, we are better prepared. We have PPE in the Commonwealth that will last till 2021. Uh, so we have done a better job now of, of stocking up uh, for gloves and, uh, and, and masks and gowns, uh, et cetera, that will last us till the end of next year. And we're also getting test results within 48 hours. So I think, um, I think again, the message for us here in Plymouth is, is ongoing education. I know there's, there's some, some real marketing people within the chamber and the schools that will come up with some great marketing cam campaigns for social media. You know, maybe there's gonna be some seniors doing from the council and agent doing TikToks or something, um, but something to, to really get the word out to people that it, it's, it's, we need to wear the mask. I, it, a lot of this is, is the, again, under the age of 50, you know, folks having um, you know, households, you know, within households having, having get togethers or, you know, intergenerational spread that's happening. There's a lot of things that are, are causing this. So education, transparency and, and testing, I think are gonna be the way um, that we will help us get back out of the red and, uh, and continue moving the economy uh, forward until there's a vaccine. You, and that's the update. For thank you, State Representative Matthew Muratori. We're now gonna go back uh, to our panel, circle around for their closing thoughts. Uh, Dr. Mark Wilson, we're going to begin with you. What do you have for us today? Can you unmute yourself, Mark? Mark, if you can unmute. So we can hear you. Apologies. Um, Go ahead. It seems as though uh, almost everyone spoke of the challenges that we're all facing, whether they're physical, mental, emotional, or financial. And yet, despite these challenges, it's still important to continue prevention measures, be extra considerate and tolerant of others around you, and recognize that this pandemic will end, not immediately, but sooner if we all do our part <coughs> in reducing transmission. And I think also given what Matt told us about how successful the Plymouth school system has been, it sounds like we all need to be behave uh, as though we were students again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson. He is our resident epidemiologist. Sarah Cloud, Director of Behavioral Health at our hospital. Sarah, you've heard all the panelists uh, speak today. What would you add? We've covered a lot of ground today. Um, it's been very helpful. I'm cautiously optimistic. It's, but it is really hard not to react strongly to what's going on in our community. Um, so these are stressful times with a lot of uncertainty and unknown. So please continue to focus on what we can control. Wear your mask, follow the science, take good care of yourself and be kind to one another. We'll get through this together. Thank you, Sarah Cloud, Director of Behavioral Health, Beth Israel Deaconess, Justin Domingos. Uh, each week at this time, we circle back and you give us a takeaway uh, that you'd like us to remember about Plymouth Public Schools and athletics. Sure, Steve. I, I think for Plymouth Public Schools and in, in the athletic department, it's resiliency. Um, you, you see it in our kids, the way they've returned to school, the attention to detail that not only the student body, but our athletes have taken, our, our coaching staffs. Uh, it's all about resiliency here. And I think um, the, the town of Plymouth is a great one and, and a resilient one and, and uh, would love to see us come out of this, this red zone soon. Thank you, Justin Domingos. He is the Director of Athletics, Plymouth North High School. Michael Jackman, you are the District Director for our Congressman. If we need to contact you or our Congressman, how do we do that? Sure, uh, 
the best way to reach us is uh, by phone, 508-746-9000. Uh, as I said, we are working uh, remotely and uh, we can be reached at that number. Our offices are closed to the public, unfortunately. And, and I, I just wanna take one last chance to talk about how important the census is because this will probably be the last time, I, last opportunity I have to talk about it. Um, a lot of funding from the federal government is uh, influenced by the census and, and the, the numbers, the population in each community, county, commonwealth, the state um, will dictate how much funding comes through the federal government to uh, residents right here in Plymouth and right here in Plymouth County. So I, I do, do urge everyone to take a moment, go to 2020census.gov, make sure that they file their census, respond to the census by the deadline, which is tomorrow night, Thursday, October 15th at 12 midnight. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michael Jackman, District Director Congressman Bill Keating, Heather Cosby, our CPA, you also mentioned that tomorrow's an important date, October 15th. You mentioned tax filings and also about writing COVID. And one of the questions I had was, what if you're filing electronically? How do you do that? When would it be appropriate to indicate uh, COVID on your filing? So you can add a note. Usually there's like a client note or somewhere you can add a note to an electronic filing. If you're late when you file, you can just write a note saying you were affected by COVID and request that any penalties be abated. And then um, it's a part of your original filing. So if you have to follow up for any reason, um, for example, if they consider you not timely filed, you know, you can always say, no, I told you that I was affected. And so that's the reason to do it. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, first of all, Amy, so good to see you. So good to see everybody. It's so nice to be back. Um, again, businesses, delay your forgiveness application, take your expenses this year, that'll probably create losses that you can carry back five years and get refunds of taxes paid. That will give you money for the winter. So it's a, it's a really succinct way to put it, but I hope that the businesses uh, can get this information and, and not be in such a rush to get that application done because you may shoot yourself in the foot by doing that. Uh, and myself personally, thank you to all the teachers in Plymouth as well as Rising Tide. My kids are happy to be a part of school. I think it's amazing. I do not know how teachers get nine-year-old boys to sit in chairs. That beyond is beyond me, so thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Heather Cosby. She's a Plymouth CPA. Amy Naples, you mentioned earlier about a pop-up on Sunday. Again, where is that? The pop-up is at Mayflower Brewing. Um, on Res Road in the Industrial Park off of Exit 7 from 11 to 4 p.m. And um, always, it's such a pleasure to be here. So great to see you all. Heather is always a tough act to follow. Wealth of information. Honestly, all of you um, give me so much information and it's so helpful in doing my job. So these shows are fantastic. Just want to commend you, Steve. Um, Ken and Matt um, for your continued support of these. And Justin, you are absolutely right. We are so resilient and so are our businesses. Um, and this season, I am pledging to support local. I am asking for you all to as well, shop small, purchase gift cards from restaurants, nail salons, hair salons, whatever it is, just support our local businesses. We have some amazing ones in town and we wanna ensure that they stay here. So please support small. Thank you, Amy Naples, Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. State Representative Matthew Miratori, last night I saw that you attended the select board meeting along with our state senator uh, presenting uh, some uh, bipartisan participation uh, with our legislative delegation. It would appear that you're all working together to respond to the coronavirus. Yeah, we are, Steve. Uh, uh, Representative Lenatra and, and Senator Moran, Moran and myself uh, join the, the board uh, at the request of the chairman. And, and really just to, to, to let them know that, that we're there, we're supporting them, they're working on behalf of, of the community to help them through whatever we can help them through with. Uh, as I said earlier, the delegation has been working uh, with the state and the county to try to get a testing site right here in Plymouth. Um, and, and you know, with all the funds that we're trying to get to the community. Um, I also want to uh, do want to commend uh, uh, the, the, uh, the county too, uh, the, the CARES Act funds that the county has is going to go into uh, some of those funds is going into what the housing program that Mike Jackman talked about as well. So they're going to be putting millions and millions of dollars into that too. So we thank the county uh, for that. 
Um, I also want to uh, reiterate what Mike had to say too, Steve, about the, the census. It's unfortunate that it's, it's actually ending this quickly, but uh, you know that's what the Supreme Court had to say. So we need, we need to do that um, by midnight uh, tomorrow night. is is good. I, I think technically it's it's actually 6 a.m. on Saturday morning because Hawaii is the last state to actually get in. But use midnight as a time frame. But if you're a little bit late, just do it anyways. Uh, get yourself in there. Um, I do like uh, you know Sarah. I, I think. You were very helpful early on with this uh, COVID for me personally, uh, as well as so many other people, because you're absolutely right. You have to learn when you're in something like this, control what you can control. Uh, and when you don't know how to deal with something, it's hard to do that. Uh, but you and your colleagues were very helpful in that. And we really appreciate your, your words and your, your advice when you do come on here. It's, it's so helpful. And it's, it's a great reminder for all of us that we can only control what we can control. And uh, that's one of the reasons I stopped watch, watching national news. I can't control that. Um, and Justin, you know, the, um, the resilience, um, the kids in the schools learn that resilience from us. And I think, uh, I think what the kids are doing now is reminding us as parents and a community that uh, we need to get back to that resilience and we need to follow the rules and you know, wear a mask. Um, you know, until we get through this, the mask wearing, as I say all the time, is is not so much for your protection as for other people's protection. So uh, we will follow what the kids are doing and we'll keep them safe and the elderly people safe and all of us safe. And again, uh, it will not be a surprise tonight when we hear that Plymouth is in the red again two weeks in a row. OK, so let's make that clear. We will be in the red again this week, uh, most likely we'll be in the red again next week as well. But let's start turning that around now. So the faster we can turn it around, the better off we are. Remember, after three weeks of being in the red, it takes three weeks after that, a minimum of three weeks to be out of the red each week after that per week. So we've got, we've got some work to do, Plymouth. But I know because of our resilience, because of our kindness, and because of our respect uh, for each other and for our community, we will do that. So let's continue working together. And thank you to PAC TV. Uh, for all you do to continue these uh, these community these important community updates now more than ever. Thank you, uh, State Representative Matthew Muratori. And just to emphasize what he was talking about being in the red and the need to improve. Uh, last Friday, my wife and I uh, left Plymouth, drove out of state, and to visit a family member. And when we before we arrived, we were told that. We could not have direct uh, a visit with a family member. We had a distance, and it was because they determined that we came from Plymouth, and Plymouth is red, and therefore they limit our participation. So understand that if we don't improve, then it can affect our ability, our freedom, if you will, uh, when we go outside of Plymouth. Uh, and at this time, we're going to circle back to uh, the chair of the select board, uh, Ken Tavares. Ken, you've been busy. Uh, with your meetings and dealing with a lot of issues in the town. And you and I will be uh, back here on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. for the start of the Plymouth Fall Town Meeting, and you will be participating. Uh, so thank you for that. And what do you have for us today as we close out this presentation? Well, just a, a brief reflection. Since March, I think we've had a number of ups and downs and where we've been encouraged and we've been discouraged. Uh, but I still remain optimistic, in spite of the fact of our new designation by the Commonwealth, that uh, uh, we will pull ourselves out. It's going to take, a, as I said earlier, neighbor to neighbor talking, making sure that we do the right things. Last night, we had a meeting that went uh, over three hours. Actually, it was one of our shorter ones. But immediately after the meeting was over, I uh, went uh, to read my emails, and uh, the one that I was looking for was the one that comes from the Board of Health. Every day, sometime between 5 and 9 o'clock at night, uh, Karen Keene is kind enough to confirm the new cases. And I just want you to, to experience what we, we had to endure last night. It just said, 13 new cases, that's high. We were uncomfortable with, with five and seven, but it started out 13. One six-year-old male and one 14-year-old male. 
and one 19-year-old male, two females in their 20s, one male in his 20s, two females in their 30s, one female in her 60s, one male in his 80s, two males in their 80s, and one female in her 90s. That's sobering. This virus does not discriminate. It does not discriminate. So I just ask you, I know that we've said this so many times that I've, I'm sure you hear it in your sleep, uh, wash hands, uh, keep uh, distance, wear a mask, but it is so important. The people that, that I listen to on the national and the state level say the same thing. So I don't think they can be wrong. We, uh, once again, together, we need to do it. I agree with Representative Muratori. We will work our way out of it, and we don't want to go back. It's, it, it's absolutely mandatory for us to pick up these pieces and go forward. We can do it, and we will as a, as a community. Thank you, and Steve, I look forward to uh, town meeting on Saturday. I think that that's one of the uh, highlights of the week. It shows that this community can still gather together and do its business. We have not lost any momentum, whether it's been with the planning board, school committee, board of selectmen, finance, advisory and finance committee, and countless others. They continue to do their work to serve the people of this great community. Thank you. Thank you. That's select board chair, Kenneth Tavares. Uh, he and I will be returning on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. on PAC TV Live, along with State Representative Matthew Muratori also participating. We'll have close to several hundred people, 135 town meeting members, and a panel of town officials and others who will be participating in town meeting. It'll be safe, it'll be healthy, it'll be virtual, uh, and we look forward uh, to doing the business of the town of Plymouth, and also to welcome a very special uh, guest, uh, we're honored to have participating in our opening ceremonies. Uh, so we look forward to having you join us again Saturday at 8 a.m. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. Thank you for joining us uh, today for this update. Good day.